Hey, this is Warren Sprouse and the Bible Forum every Sunday night from 8 to 10 p.m. right here. Uh, we talk about life, look at it through a biblical lens. I want to give you a little bit of a glimpse into how our president makes critical decisions. This has to do largely with the transgender issue. We all know by now that our federal government is regulating lavatory use in public schools, government buildings, and that sort of thing. And it's all about the transgender thing. The transgender issue is all about the progressive philosophy of redefining words to create new realities, whether it be political, economic, and or social. In a recent town hall meeting in Elkhart, Indiana, President Obama said that it that it was his understanding of scripture that led him to issue the transgender bathroom directive to public schools. According to Christian Post, Obama said he issued the directive to public schools so that transgender students would not be bullied. Now, keep in mind, this word bully has taken on a life of its own. There's hardly anything you can say to another human being that somebody can't consider bullying. The quote from our president is this. He said, my reading of scripture tells me that the golden rule is pretty high up there in terms of my Christian belief. The Transgender Bathroom Directive states that public schools must allow transgender students to use the restroom of their choosing and not necessarily the restroom that corresponds to their biological gender. Eleven states, Alabama, Arizona, Georgia, Louisiana, Maine, Oklahoma, Tennessee, Texas, Utah, West Virginia, and Wisconsin are suing over that directive. You have to ask yourself, where's South Carolina? <laughs> Georgia, Alabama. Uh, the states that stood up against Obamacare. The lawsuit states that the directive would turn public schools, quote, into laboratories for a massive social experiment, flouting the democratic process and running roughshod over common sense policies, protecting children and basic privacy rights. The president, however, remains undeterred. What happens, he says, and what continues to happen is you have transgender kids in school and they get bullied and they get ostracized and it's tough for them. I have profound respect for everybody's religious beliefs on this. But if you're at a public school, the question is how do we just make sure that children are treated with kindness? Well, the question is, is it kindness that allows these children and others to believe they are the opposite sex simply because they feel like it. Sometimes I feel like a nut. Sometimes I don't. Now, in sympathy, there are apparently people whose bodies do not produce the chemicals necessary to definitively, definitively develop their bodies into whatever gender they appear to be. The difficulty is with boys who develop more like girls. They like girly things. Their bodies are more lithe and slender. Girls who develop more like boys are not so difficult. We've always had tomboys. They seem to be able to get along just fine. The issue is not the small percentage of children who suffer some sort of chemical or hormonal problem. The issue is with children and adults who simply feel they'd like to be the opposite sex and then the rest of us have to be okay with it. And we are, until it becomes a bathroom or a shower issue, primarily in schools. In public places, there are family lavatories. In other places, if the person is dressing like a girl, unless you asked, you wouldn't know. No harm, no foul. The problem is with Mary, who has a beard or with Bob, who has breasts. The progressive philosophy redefines words to create alternate realities, then pass legislation, or in the case 
of the current sitting president issue executive orders to force the entire population to stand on its head in order to accommodate a truly small minority. There are no more than 4% of Americans who are homosexual. The percentage of transgenders is hardly measurable, even if we all know one. Current U.S. policy is not nearly as concerned with Christian preferences as it is with pagan preferences, and the U.S. is built on Christian principle. Our president has no understanding of holy writ. He has regularly revealed his total ignorance of God and of the Bible and what he has said. Now, now we get a Bible verse. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It doesn't apply in this situation. If it did, public policy would take my concerns, my preferences into account as well. It would tolerate all sorts of antisocial behavior simply to keep from offending anybody. How can you require people to keep to the right as they drive their car with this philosophy or not enter through a certain door or be required to produce a driver's license upon request? These are absolutes without regard to my feelings or convictions on any issue. It has nothing to do with my gender. If my feelings are hurt by a law enforcement officer telling me to leave the premises, is that not violating the golden rule? Or is it a recipe for public order, the greater good? I say God help us and deliver us from pseudo-Christians spouting words from the Bible to support their private causes. Now, in, in speaking to the, the transgender issue, a fellow by the name of Walt Heyer has written an article subtitled, It's Time to Stop Using Children as Experiments. And he asked the question, do you have any understanding of the serious medical problems that face transgender persons? A 2016 study comparing 20 Lebanese transgender participants to 20 control subjects reported the transgender individuals suffer more from psychiatric pathologies compared to the general population. More than 50% had active suicidal thoughts, 45% had had a major depressive episode. It is no longer politically correct to link psychological disorders with the transgender population. However, the researchers see the evidence that the link exists. The author of this piece is a former transgender person. He says he wished the guy who approved him for, trans for gender surgery would have told him of the risks. The problems are doctors are too quick to diagnose. The experience of many gender-confused individuals is that medical professions are quick to reach a diagnosis of gender, gender dysphoria and then immediately recommend cross-gender hormone therapy and irreversible reassignment surgery bef without investigating and treating the coexisting issues. And research has found that powerful psychological issues such as anxiety disorder, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, alcohol drug dependence, or any number of accompanying gender issues create the problems. A study published in Journal of American Medical Association Pediatrics in March of 2016 shows a high prevalence of psychiatric diagnoses in a sample of 298 young transgender women aged 16 through 29 years of age. More than 40% had coexisting mental health or substance dependent diagnoses. One in five had two or more psychiatric diagnoses. The most commonly occurring disorders were major depressive episodes and non-alcoholic psychoactive substance use dependent. Why are transgender individuals never required to undergo any objective test to prove their gender dysphoria? 
Well, the answer is because there's no diagnostic objective test available. They think it, a doctor agrees, it's done. The cause of this condition can't be verified through lab results, a brain scan, a review of the DNA makeup. Research studies from 2013 and from 2009 uh, looking for a transgender gene showed not a smidgen of abnormality in the genetic makeup that causes someone to be transgender. No alterations in the main sex determining genes in the male to female transsexual individuals were found, suggesting strongly that male born transgender persons are normal males biologically. A 2015 study of 118 individuals diagnosed with gender dysphoria found that 29.6% were also found to have dissociative disorders and a high prevalence of lifetime major depressive episodes. This leads researchers to look more at psychological care than, the, than surgical procedure. They found that suicide attempts occurred in 21% of these cases. Childhood trauma, 45.8%. It also remarked that differentiating between a diagnosis of dissociative disorder and gender dysphoria is difficult because the two closely resemble each other. Another study found a surprisingly high prevalence of emotional maltreatment in the 41 transsexuals they studied. It called for further investigation to clarify the effects of traumatic childhood experiences. One area where medical professionals should treat, tread lightly is in the diagnosis and the treatment of children who have gender identity issues. A 2015 study aimed to gather input from pediatric endocrinologists, psychologists, psychiatrists, ethicists, etc., using uh, the not using but favoring uh, those who opposed early treatment uh, to further ethical debate. The results showed no consensus on many basic topics of childhood gender dysphoria and insufficient research to support any recommendations for treatment in children, including the currently published guidelines that recommend suppressing puberty with drugs until age 16 after which cross-sex hormones may be given. An analysis of 38 youth referrals for gender dysphoria to the Pediatric Endocrinology Clinic at the University School of Medicine in Indianapolis showed that more than half had psychiatric and or development comorbidities. Without sufficient research and consensus on treatment of children diagnosed with gender dysphoria and knowing over half have coexisting disorders, any invasive treatment, they said, even if recommended by the current guidelines, is simply an experiment. These people are struggling psychologically. They need psychological help. They don't necessarily need access to cross-sex restroom showers and dressing areas. Blaming society for the ills of transgenders isn't going to improve the diagnosis or the treatment. Enforcing the preferred pronoun isn't going to do it. The compassion that we need to show these people is in the way we treat them medically, not in whether or not we allow them into the other bathroom. 